Introduction to Animal Agriculture, the Minnesota Dairy Industry. Let's begin with some terminology and an overview of dairy production systems. According to the USDA, most dairy cows in the United States are Holsteins or Holstein Cross, a breed that tends to produce more milk per cow than other breeds. Other breeds commonly found in Minnesota would include the Jersey, Brown Swiss, Guernsey, and Ayrshire breeds. Today's dairy cows are more productive than ever. Even though there are fewer dairy farmers, milk production per cow has increased significantly. In the mid-1950s, the average milk production per cow was 6,400 pounds per year, which would provide 754 gallons of milk, 641 pounds of cheese, and 534 gallons of ice cream. By 2004, milk production per cow had more than doubled to 17,500 pounds per year. The dairy cow's feed and water consumption depend on animal size, milk production level, stage of lactation, weather, diet, and management. To get the level of production described in the last slide, a typical lactating Holstein can eat up to 80 pounds of dry matter each day. Water consumption can range from a low of 18 gallons per day for low-producing cows in cool weather to 36 gallons of water per day for high-producing cows in hot weather. A lactating cow produces about 70 pounds or 8 gallons of milk per day. A high-producing cow can produce as much as 17 gallons per day. Dairy cows produce between 90 and 120 pounds of manure per day. There are various stages of production in the dairy industry. They include calf rearing, young and growing heifer stages, and the lactation stage. Some producers may raise animals in all segments of the industry, while others specialize in only one stage. Most dairy producers feed calves colostrum immediately after birth. The calves are removed from their mothers as soon as possible, typically within two to six days. Removing the calf from the cow prevents the spread of disease from mother to baby. Newborn calves are then moved to a calf housing facility. There are a couple different calf housing facility options which we'll look at later. Most bull calves are sold immediately and enter the beef industry. Calf hutches are individual shelter for calves to help prevent the spread of disease. The calves are housed here for two months. During that time they receive about one to two gallons of milk and a calf starter. The calves will consume only milk until they are 30 to 60 days old. The calf hutches are portable plastic shelters that face south during winter months. This protects them from winter winds and allows them exposure to the sun. Hutches are often moved to shady areas during the summer since they are plastic and can get quite warm. Another option for calf housing is individual box stalls. Management is essentially the same between these and calf hutches. When the calves are 60 to 90 days old, they're moved to group housing facilities such as the super hutch you see here. They can also be housed in other types of group pens. At this stage, the heifers are dehorned to prevent injury. The pens are cleaned and bedded with straw, wood shavings, corn stalks, or other bedding materials. The heifers remain here until they're about four months old. During this time, they're fed starter grain diets that include corn, oats, and molasses. At four months, heifers enter the growing stage. They are switched from a starter grain diet to feed containing high levels of forages. This could be silage or dry forages. Silage is a moist feedstuff made by storing and fermenting a green crop such as corn or hay in a silo or bunker where it has limited exposure to air. Forages are crops grown for livestock feed, such as grass, which can be grazed directly by the cow or harvested and stored for later use, such as baled alfalfa hay. Heifers are housed in group facilities during this stage. They may be housed in an open fronted barn, such as the one shown on the left. The cows may also have access to pasture or an exercise lot. A variety of bedding materials, including chopped straw or corn stalks, may be used for a bedding pack. The primary goal during this stage is to prepare the heifers for breeding at 15 to 16 months of age. Cattle have a nine-month gestation period, so most heifers will have their first calf when they're about two years old. A heifer must have a calf in order to start producing milk. Once she's calved, she becomes part of the milking dairy herd. A typical lactation period is between 10 and 12 months. 
the use of the naturally occurring hormone bovine somatotropin, known as BST, increases milk production about 8 to 10 pounds per cow per day. All cows naturally produce BST, but by giving the cow more than she naturally produces, milk production is increased. Milk from cows treated with BST is no different than milk from cows not treated with BST. In fact, you cannot test the milk and determine if the milk is from cows treated with BST. Some producers choose not to use this hormone because of consumer concerns. The dry or transition period is the time prior to calving when a cow is not producing milk. This dry period allows the cow to prepare for the next lactation. According to a 2006 study by the Minnesota Dairy Herd Improvement Association, the average dry period is 60 days. Nutrition and management programs during this phase directly affect the incidence of post-calving disorders, milk production, and reproduction in subsequent lactations. After calving, the cow goes back to the milking herd, is bred through artificial insemination in order to use the best genetics possible, and the cycle starts over again. Let's move now to an overview of the common dairy cow housing systems, the tie stall, free stall, and compost barns. Tie stall barns historically have been a common method of housing cows in the Midwest. However, as herds have grown, they have become less common due to labor inefficiency. Cows are tied or secured in a stall, the cows are fed in their stalls, and a gutter is used to remove manure. In tie stall barns, the cows are milked in their stall, and the milking machines are moved from cow to cow. Cows are often moved outside during the day into concrete or dirt exercise lots. In free stall barns, cows have freedom to move in and out of the stalls and to the feeding area. The feed area is typically an alley that runs down the middle or one side of the barn as shown by the yellow arrow. Free stall barns are separate from the milking parlor where they are milked. Free stall barns are common in dairy herds with a hundred cows or more. Free stall barns have gained in popularity because of improved cow comfort and reduced labor compared to traditional tie stall barns. The stall area has a soft surface for the cows to lie on, and this is typically sand or a bedding covered mattress filled with ground rubber. Compost dairy barns are a fairly new concept in dairy housing. In this type of barn, there are no individual stalls. Instead, cows have access to a large area bedded with sawdust, which is tilled twice daily to encourage drying and composting. Cows also have access to a feed alley, which is usually located on one side of the barn. Like freestall barns, cows are moved from the barn to a parlor for milking. The primary advantage of this type of barn is the excellent cow comfort. Manure that collects in the feed alley is scraped daily and hauled to temporary storage areas. The disadvantage of the compost dairy barn is increased bedding cost and the slightly larger space required per animal. This type of barn is gaining popularity with small to mid-sized dairies. Cows are moved from the free stall or compost barns to a milking parlor two to three times a day to be milked. Cows come into the parlor in groups based on the number of hookups for milking or milking units. There are several milking parlor arrangements for cow flow and milking ease. This is a layout for what is known as a parallel parlor because the cows are parallel to each other during milking. In this system, cows are milked from behind. Cows are milked from the side in the herringbone system. The goal of any milking parlor design is to move cows through quickly with as little labor as possible. This statistic is known as parlor efficiency and is measured in cows per hour. Here's a look at a herringbone parlor. As with the other types of parlor systems, the people milking the cows stand at a lower level, so there's less bending. Also, there's not much movement between cows, making the systems much more efficient than with traditional stanchion barns. Parlor areas are washed down after each milking. The wash water typically is added to the manure storage system. Another milking system that is gaining in popularity in larger dairies is the rotary milking system. In this, the cows get on a slowly rotating platform and are milked as the platform turns. The step-up parlor is common in remodeled stanchion barns. The cows move into the parlor in small groups and step up into milking stalls. Step-up parlors are not as efficient as the other types of parlors discussed. Dairy Industry Trends and Issues The number of dairy operations in the U.S. has steadily declined in the past 10 years from approximately 130,000 in 1996 
to less than 70,000 in 2006. That's a 40% decrease in the last decade. The same trend is occurring in Minnesota. A majority of Minnesota counties are losing milk cows. The greatest losses are in Todd, Ottertail, and Goodhue counties. However, a few counties have increased milk cow inventory, including Nobles, Stearns, and Pope. Minnesota is losing dairy cows at a faster rate than the rest of the nation as a whole. This means that Minnesota is losing market share in the dairy industry. Historically, Minnesota consistently ranked number two or three in the United States. In 2005, Minnesota was ranked only sixth in the nation. Since 2000, Minnesota has lost nearly 50,000 dairy cows, which equals one billion pounds of milk per year. An increase in productivity per cow offsets some of the loss in total cow numbers, but not entirely. As milk production in the state decreases, milk processors close due to lack of milk to process. This starts a downward spiral, since few new dairies will move into an area where there are no processors. While the number of dairy farms is decreasing, the average size of dairy operations in Minnesota has increased. Minnesota has lost 50% of dairies with less than 200 cows since 1993. Nationwide, over half of milk cows are part of a dairy operation with 500 or more cows. Less than 10% of U.S. milk cows are owned by producers who have herds of 50 cows or less. The dairy industry is moving out of the upper Midwest to states like Idaho and California. This is mostly due to labor efficiency of larger herds and an attitude that encourages the dairy industry to grow locally. These states are also seen as having less regulatory requirements. Producers expanding into the western states typically have new facilities with modern technology. They generally build large dairies, allowing them lower production costs than smaller, traditional dairies in the Midwest. There are many challenges facing Minnesota's dairy producers. Compared to other states, Minnesota has a high cost of production. This is largely due to Minnesota dairy farmers needing to modernize their facilities. A large percentage of Minnesota dairy producers still use inefficient tie stall barns. Rather than update facilities, many producers are simply leaving the industry, leaving less and less dairies in our state. As the local milk supply declines, dairy processors will leave as well, causing a loss in infrastructure needed to sustain the industry. Even when producers want to update their facilities, they are faced with challenges. Compared with other states, it's more difficult to get a permit for expansion or new construction in Minnesota due to community concerns about the environment. Finally, many dairy producers were raised on a dairy farm and enjoy the interaction with livestock. However, they don't have the desire or experience to manage employees, and finding people who want to work on a dairy farm is difficult. Despite seemingly bad news, there can be a bright future for the upper Midwest dairy industry, but we'll need to do things differently than in the past. Here's a look at what helps make Minnesota stand out in the dairy industry. Because of our cheese plants and proximity to cheese demand on the East Coast, our milk prices are often very competitive with anywhere in the country. In many parts of the state, we still have a great infrastructure with knowledgeable and dedicated service providers and dairy producers. We have the lowest feed costs in the U.S. Minnesota feed costs typically average one to a dollar and a quarter less per cow per day than in California or Idaho. We take for granted our readily available supply of clean, cheap water. And in most parts of the state, we have an adequate supply of high quality labor. For more information about the Minnesota dairy industry, visit the University of Minnesota Extension website at www.extension.umn.edu slash dairy. You can also visit the Minnesota Milk Producers Association website at mnmilk.org.